How did the meeting go this morning? Which meeting? You know, about the new advertising. Oh, I wasn't there. Yes, I know, but Barry was, wasn't he? What did he say about it? I'm really not sure, to be honest. I haven't seen Barry since yesterday morning. But he had some real big problems with the new campaign and was going to tell the advertising people about it. Yes, that's why I wanted to know how it went. Could you tell him to come up and see me as soon as he gets back from the Harper Industries Conference? I'll leave him a message. I have to go now. I'm picking my daughter up from school. Henry, we've had some serious complaints about the windows that were installed yesterday at the home of Hannah Westwood. What do you know about it? That was Phil and Mike over at the Westwood house yesterday at around 3 p.m. Why? What was the problem? They told me everything went well. She called us this morning and she said, well, it was her husband, Jim, actually. He said the guys who installed the windows left an awful mess around the back of the house, that the front was fine. But when they went around the back of the house, they found smashed pieces of their old windows and pieces of the old frame scattered around the place. They have two expensive pedigree dogs and one of them cut his paw on some glass. Oh, no, that doesn't sound too good. No, it doesn't. They want us to pay for the vet bills. Otherwise, they say they're going to take the company to court. I need to speak to, what were their names? Phil Owen and Mike Gomez. Yes, them. I need to speak to them to get all the facts before I get in touch with the Westwoods again. They may have forgotten to clean up at the back of the house, but it seems we are going to have to pay out some money anyway. I'll go and find them now. Jane, have you seen the new design for our website? Yes, I was just looking at it, in fact. When is it going public? Oh, and it won't be ready for launch until at least the middle of next week. What did you like about it? Well, I'm not a web expert or anything, but it just looked nice and clean. You know, the site at the moment, well, it's a bit crowded, isn't it? And I had a look at the shopping cart page. That looks so much better organized. I can't really understand the present system. I know. It's really confusing, isn't it? With this new design, we're hoping to increase sales and start making much more of a profit from the web side of business. You know, Ted Jackson wants us to be making a third of our profits online within two years. That sounds like a lot. How much do we make now? Oh, around 7%. But I think with this new site design, plus the advertising we're putting out on local radio, that will double in a matter of months. Let's hope so. Excuse me, can you just sign here, please? What's this? We weren't expecting any deliveries. Let's see. We have some toner for the photocopier, three boxes of A4 paper, and some other odd things such as staples and post-it notes. Oh, yes. We ran out of paper this morning. It's lucky you came now. I was just closing the office. We're all going to a meeting, so we close at 4 this afternoon. Do I need to pay you now? Oh, no. We will bill you at the end of the month as usual. I just need your signature here. Oh, and another one here. Great. Thanks a lot. Oh, can you tell the person in charge of supplies that we won't be open on Thursday and Friday next week? So if you need anything, you'll have to get your order in to us by close of business on Wednesday. And we'll be open again on Saturday morning. No problem. I'll tell Darren. He's the guy who does all of that. Bye now. Bye. Have a nice day. I can't believe how much they've charged us for that conference in Dusseldorf last month. Let me have a look. Wow, you're right. How come? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. They told us the inclusive price would be 2000 This is 20% more. You know, that conference was really useful. We made some good contacts and will probably sell three or four properties because of it. Yes, I know that, Brian, but it's the principle of the matter. They said we would be charged only $2,000, and then a bill for $2,350 arrives. Oh, look at this, Jessica. This was the original email they sent us two months ago. Right, let me see. Okay, conference, real estate, Dusseldorf, 19th to the 21st. Yes, look, right there, 2000 Oh, wait, that's in euros. I don't believe it. They give us the price in euros and bill us in dollars. That's a bit sneaky, don't you think? Okay, 
That was interesting, Claire. Thanks for that report. Now I'd like to turn to what Barry has been doing for the last couple of weeks. Barry? Thank you, Sophie. Now, as you may remember, our group was asked to carry out a comprehensive survey about American vacation habits, especially pertaining to Europe. Could you tell us all something about how these results were obtained first, Barry, before we move on to the real bones of the results? Yes, of course. We've been running ads on travel and tourism websites over the last couple of weeks, and anyone who completes the survey had their email address put into a draw and... Um, I can't remember what the prizes were, but you know, the usual sort of thing. MP3 players, mountain bikes. I think the top prize was a Vespa scooter. Pretty good, really. Remind me to ask Stephanie. She was responsible for the prizes. I would have liked that Vespa for myself. Now, we had a total of 11,500 responses, so the reaction was pretty good, I'm sure you'll agree. We were also running ads for our European guidebooks alongside the surveys and sending another targeted ad to each of the email addresses. I was speaking to sales this morning and they calculate we've had something in the region of 600 extra book sales through this promotion, so that just about covers the cost of the prizes anyway. That's really good work, Barry. You've done a fine job with that survey. Now to the results. I just want to say a few words first about why we were doing the survey. Is that okay? But of course. Yes, we should hear about that first. We are totally revising all our European City Guide category of guidebooks for next season, so we wanted to know why people were heading for Europe, what they wanted to do once they were there, and what would persuade them to go back. Particularly relevant to ourselves were questions about what they used guidebooks for and how important recommendations about where to go were in their minds. Oh, and what financial category of tourist they saw themselves as. You know, budget traveler, biz exec type, and so on. So we had over 11,000 responses in all? Yes, and I just wanted to outline a few of the main findings of the survey. We first asked people to say how often they went on vacation, and 88% said they tried to at least once a year, with 27% saying twice a year. We asked how many would be interested in taking a city break in Europe, which of course is the focus of our new range of guidebooks. Europe is still very popular, isn't it? Well, it would seem so, as more than two-thirds said they would enjoy the chance of going on a city break there. Paris came out on top, followed by London, Rome, and Berlin. That coincides precisely with the order in which our guidebooks on those cities will be released next spring. That is good to know. Now, what about the reasons people are coming to Europe and how we can use this information? Well, we asked all our respondents who had been to Europe why they had chosen to go there over another destination, and the main reasons were as follows, in this order. Culture, historical places, family connections, language considerations, that's for going to Britain or Ireland, obviously. And finally, because other members of their family wanted to come. I think the primary reasons given are more important for a guidebook publisher like ourselves. I think we need to focus more on the cultural and historical aspects in our European City Guide collection of guidebooks. And I think we need to make that especially clear in our advertising campaigns for these books. In that way, we can both persuade people to go to Europe for the cultural aspects and also to buy our books at the same time. You said before that you had asked the people taking this survey to classify themselves. What was the thinking behind that, Barry? Well, we like to ask people how they see themselves as it tells us something about how likely they are to buy and use one of our guidebooks. People who see themselves as travelers before tourists which was some 64% in our survey, are more likely to purchase one of our city guides. In order to find out all the interesting things there are for them to visit in the role as travelers. Exactly. Now another very important targeted question we asked concerned what our vacationers did in preparation for their big trip. How many of them would consider buying one of our guidebooks, for example? We ended up with a long list of what people do to prepare for a vacation abroad. Watching TV programs about their destination was the most popular at 37% of respondents. 29% would visit websites to find out more, and then 22% would buy or consider buying a guidebook, which is where we come in, of course. 
Then there were some other answers given, such as asking friends for recommendations, visiting their public library to do some research, and getting information from the travel section of the newspapers. Barry, were there any results from this survey that you would say were surprising or unexpected? Well, one of our final questions gave us a few surprises, to be honest. We asked how reliable people thought different sources of information were, whether they believed everything they heard or read on TV, websites, and in guidebooks like ours. And I presume that they would trust our books more, wouldn't they? We thought that too, which is why we were so surprised when both travel websites and TV programs came out ahead of us. It seems people trust the information in our guidebooks a little less as they consider the information to be possibly out of date, whereas websites and the TV are supposed to give totally up-to-date information. It's something I think we need to tackle in our next advertising campaign. Well, we certainly have plenty to think about. I can see the European City Division is going to be busy for the next few months. Now, I want to move on to the latest sales figures for our Asia Department. Now, you'll all remember how last year was. With me today on Business Matters is George Jensen, the new CEO of Savannah Software. Welcome to the show, George. It's great to be here. How long have you had your feet under the desk at Savannah? Well, it's been about a month now, a pretty hectic month, I must say. And how are you finding things? Savannah is a very strong company. Good financials, buckets of potential for future growth. There's no way I would have even considered coming to Savannah if I wasn't already sold on what a fine company it was. But you left your previous company and went to Savannah also knowing the company had underperformed in the last few years. Every company has the potential to perform better. If you didn't believe that, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. So where do you see room for improvement at Savannah? What areas have you earmarked for your attention in these early days of your leadership? Well, obviously I'm not going to be giving away any trade secrets here on your show, Diana. However great I think your show is, but it's no secret that Savannah has lost its focus somewhat in recent times. We need to get back to basics, which is, of course, high-quality, competitive software for businesses. Where has this loss of focus been most evident, in your opinion? I don't think Savannah has any business trying to force itself into the home entertainment market. In time, of course, that might well change and we can reassess the software landscape at that time. For now, though, Savannah needs to return to its core business. What is Savannah's core business? What are its flag-bearing software applications? We've seen you branch out into entertainment areas such as gaming and, if I may say so, low-standard educational titles. Well, perhaps I don't share the severity of your opinion concerning some of our recent publications, but yes, we do have core applications. Text-to-speech and speech-to-text applications for businesses are what put us on the map. And we need to focus our attention back there because we have lost a significant amount of market share. Others have come along and beaten us at our own game. They've made improvements where we should have done so, met customer requirements where we failed. In short, we must return at Savannah to the very pinnacle of business software solutions. We can't be playing catch-up anymore. What about your prices? One of the biggest criticisms I've heard about Savannah was the disparity between quality and price. We spend a huge amount on research and development. Our prices do reflect the work that goes into the development of what is a very complex software. If we think we can gain market advantage by dropping our prices, that's, of course, something worth considering. I read an interview you gave in Business Weekly a week or so ago. In there, you said you wanted to bring Savannah to the world, or rather, the non-English-speaking world. I spoke before about looking for areas of potential growth, areas where we have been historically weak, and I think this is certainly one of them. There's no reason why we can't produce our top language recognition software for business people in Paris, Madrid, Munich, or anywhere else for that matter. Savannah has been too inward-looking, too parochial in the past. You know, the first thing I did when I got into my new office in Boston was to put a map of the world on the wall above my desk. 
that there wasn't one, I think, speaks volumes about some strategic mistakes that this company has made in the past. What about the mobile revolution? As of this moment, there isn't a single Savannah app available for any mobile device. And I'm thinking that so many of the products that you offer would be perfectly suitable for development as an app. Are there any plans in that direction? Well, there are now. No, obviously, this is something we've been thinking about for quite some time. Clearly, we should have been more proactive and had something on the market already. But we will do. There will be something by the end of the year. There is a fantastic potential for using our software on mobile devices, phones, iPads, things of that type. Our applications were designed for a fast-moving business world, and their use on handheld devices is a dream come true. We think it's a match made in heaven. George Jensen, new CEO at Savannah Software, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. We'd love you to come back and talk to us once you've been in the job for another little while longer. That would be fantastic. Colin, sit down for a minute. I want you to send some emails out today while I'm seeing the representative from Paris. You're not doing much at the moment, are you? Well, I am, actually. I still have to finish the proposal on the Benson Industries merger. Oh, I forgot about that. Well, we don't need that until Thursday, so get these mails out for me first, okay? All right, no problem. First, of most importance, write to Max over at Catering. He wants to see the invoice we were sent by that Australian company. Attach the invoice. You'll find it in the folder, Asia. Tell him the reason it is 10% higher than the expected is that we made a last-minute change and it's perfectly fine. Have you got that? Okay. Why is that so important? Well, he sent me a mail this morning saying he wanted to phone the company. He'll cause problems, so get straight on to that. Next, could you just send a quick mail to Donald Bronson, who's flying out to us from Manchester, England? You'll find his address in this year's customers. Tell him the hotel has now been confirmed and will be leaving the information pack behind the reception desk. It's the Three Seasons Hotel, you know, just off Hudson Street. They're expecting him around 8.30. Right. Next. That Graham Watson. Wilson. What's his name? The website guy. Um, Winson. Graham Winson. He was in last week chatting to Sarah. Yes, that's him. Tell him we thought his estimate a little costly and that we're going with someone else. Apologize to him and say we're terribly sorry you know, blah, blah, blah. It sounded as if he was relying on this contract with us, but to be honest, his designs weren't that great for what we were asking. Okay, I'll tell him. Yes, Colin, but I don't want you to actually write that. No, no, I understand. I'll be all polite and apologetic. Hmm, make sure you are. Then write back to Food Monthly. You know the food magazine? Are we going to go ahead with the advertising deal with them? No, we've chosen your cuisine, and I'll be writing to tell them myself this evening. Just tell them we were highly impressed with their media pack, but budget constraints at this time of year, etc., etc. You know the deal. Fine. Consider it done. Was there another one? You said five. Did I? Mm, I can't think what the other one was. Oh, yes. Just send an email to La Massage Rouge confirming the dinner party for next Friday. I prefer to put these things in writing, you know. You remember what that Italian restaurant did to us last year when we phoned to book. We don't have that address on the computer, do we? No, just have a quick look around on the web and you'll come across it. Look, I really have to go now. I have to be across town in a quarter of an hour. Get those mails done for me, please. I can't be worrying about whether this stuff is getting done. Hey, I'm on it. Go and enjoy yourself sipping champagne and eating snails all day. Oh, yeah, if only. See you this evening. Okay, bye, Margaret. You put some paper, not too much, in the small space. Press down hard on top, and then it collects all the little pieces below, so you have to empty it every now and again. There is also a small plastic ruler that you can slide out, which helps you to get the paper in the middle.
I find it very useful if I need to cut the paper very accurately, and of course very straight, which I can't do if I use a pair of scissors. You can also cut 10 or 15 sheets of paper at once, which you could never do with scissors. Our one is pretty old, however, and Jane cut her finger last week on it. I think we will get a new one soon. I have to do a lot of graphical documents, and if you need to transfer photos or graphs from old books, it's the only way you can do it. We also have a lot of photographs of the people who work here, and we have recently been putting those onto our website, so it's been used a lot for that. I don't like using this, but I had to last week. We did a type of video conference with the managing director of a company in Scotland. He wanted to see something with his own eyes, so we needed to use it. It always makes me look older, I think. Some of my colleagues love using it. You need a good internet connection, which we have here in the office. We have a very old one in the office, and we must get a new one as soon as possible. Sometimes the computer doesn't see it, and it only does black and white anyway. When we want documents to be in color, we have to go to the office store down the road. One positive thing, however, it's extremely quiet. Sometimes I think I have forgotten to turn it on, and sometimes, of course, I do forget to turn it on. This is getting used less and less now. Most people just prefer to send us an email as it is much more convenient and quicker. I can also use it to copy documents when our photocopier is broken, which is very handy. We won't be replacing this one when it stops working. I work for a government department where security is an absolute priority. It's not possible for us to just throw important documents into the garbage. We have to be very careful about sensitive information so this machine is used every day. You get left with all these little strips and these are put into large bags. Sometimes it feels like working for the CIA. Now we have another caller. Sheila from Colorado. Thank you for calling Dr. Ibsen's A Problem Shared. What can I help you with today? Oh, good evening, Dr. Ibsen. I'm so nervous about phoning a radio show like this. Don't worry, Sheila. Many of our callers are first-time callers. Well, I feel a little embarrassed because I don't think I have a serious problem. Not like some of the other callers I listen to. I have a happy marriage and two wonderful children, but I have a few problems at work and I can't find any solutions. I think nearly half the calls we receive on this show are about some type of work problem. You must remember that our jobs take up a third of our lives, often more. And if you're not happy at work, then probably you won't be happy in your life. What type of work do you do, Sheila? I work for a large magazine. And I'm responsible for selling advertising. It's a very competitive business. There's enormous pressure on me. There isn't anyone helping me. Plus, I'm all alone in a small office without any windows. The stress becomes so bad that I'm having problems sleeping enough every night. That sounds terrible. No windows. How can anybody work like that? My boss says it helps everybody to concentrate. Concentrate on going crazy, perhaps. How many people work for the magazine, Sheila? Oh, about 50. Do you speak to others about the pressure of work? About not sleeping very well? No, there's no feeling of team spirit in the company. It's just a collection of individuals. I think that's one of the biggest problems, really. Yes, many companies don't understand the importance of a good support structure in the workplace. Human resources isn't only about selecting the correct applicant for the job, but also helping and supporting them once they've started working. Do you have any other problems apart from time pressure and the physical office that you have to work in? There are few chances for us to get help. The magazine started ten years ago and there were only six or seven of us then. It's grown so big, so fast, that I think it's grown too fast. 
And even though there are 50 of you in the office, I think your company still acts and thinks like a startup. Yes, that's exactly what I said to my husband a few months ago. It's a puppy trying to be a big dog. Okay. The first thing you need to do is speak honestly with your boss. Your boss is not a monster and would like the magazine to be as successful as possible. Having happy workers is an important part of that. Of course. She's a wonderful person. Okay. So go and speak to her. Explain what you've explained to me tonight. Do you feel nervous about doing that? No, it was actually far more terrifying calling you tonight. Right. So you've done the hard part. It's probably something your company, your boss, isn't aware of. This need to provide more support for all the employees. It's not enough for people to collect their pay slips at the end of the month. They need to feel supported, feel comfortable and, yes, feel a little loved. Thank you, Dr. Ibsen. I really do feel a lot better having spoken about it. You're welcome, Sheila. Good luck, and let us know what happens. I will. Thank you. Have a good evening. Hello, Christopher. I need to speak to you. You're going to the Boston trade show, aren't you? Am I? That's news to me. Oh, I thought you already knew. Steve can't go. His wife is expecting a baby. So it has to be you. My first trade show. I'm quite excited. There's a lot to plan and think about. Take some notes. Okay. Let me get a pen. It's next Thursday, right? Yes. The trade show opens on Thursday the 18th and will run for two days. It finishes at 6 p.m. Friday. Now, have a look at this plan. There's the floor plan for the whole thing. Wow, it's big. Yes, it is. Our stand is number 321. That's a good position on the corner. Yes, I think we should do very well in this trade show. A lot of the big companies, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, will be in that half of the room. So I think we're going to get a lot of passing traffic. Where will our competition be? Good question. Console Solutions are in 322, almost opposite you, so you'll be able to keep an eye on them. DMZ are in 124 on the other side of the hall. I'm not sure about Cisnet. They didn't go last year, did they? No, I know they're attending Tech Expo in San Diego the following week. So maybe they won't be at this trade show. I hope not. Right, Christopher. All your hotel and flight details have been arranged. I think you'll get an email with all of that tonight. You'll be traveling with two others, Graham Nash and Liz Sorrell. All right. Here's what you need to do before departure. Read the trade show manual. That will help you to understand everything about the show. Where can I find that? I have the PDF on my laptop. I'll email it to you. You need to set targets for what you want to do at this trade show. You mean how many software packages we can sell? Yes, but other things too. How many business cards you can give out, how many journalists you can speak to, how many phone numbers from educational institutions you can collect, that type of thing. Of course, these trade shows are about becoming better known. Exactly. Go and speak to Ray Jones. He's the guy who designed our stand for the trade show. He'll be in his office at three. He's expecting you. The stand is quite high tech with some awesome software demos. But you need to learn how to use it. Ray Jones. Okay. I'll go and see him. Anything else? Yes. Uh, we need to change our website. We need to put something about our participation at the Boston Trade Show. Advertise our attendance. What do you think? I'll speak to the website group and ask them to put something on the top of every page. Yes, something like that. Tomorrow, I'll be calling all our big customers and telling them that we'll be in Boston next week. It's going to be great. You'll enjoy it, Chris. You'll be tired, but you'll enjoy it. <laughs>